Well, uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Cornock, and I'm part of the e-learning development team uh, within the Academic Support Office. And this session here is titled Flipped Classroom Approaches, um, in brackets design. We're looking here at the, the pedagogical models around Flipped Classroom, uh, looking at some case studies, looking at perhaps what sort of technology we could use to deliver the Flipped Classroom approach. Uh, and then there'll be a follow-up session, perhaps later this term, um, which will look at uh, how to use things like personal capture, how you might want to distrib distribute your recordings, and how you might create a VLE site to deliver flipped classroom models um, from a technical perspective. But the main thing to think about is actually some of the, the issues and constraints around flipped classroom models to begin with. So all I'd like, first of all, is to just um, you to tell me what you believe the flipped classroom model is to you. What does the term flipped classroom or flipped learning mean to you? If you want to shout out or if you want to put your answer in the text box to begin with, that'd be great. The idea is to make the in-class activity more active. Um, so if we think of a traditional lecture format, it's quite passive, perhaps, not always the case. Um, but the idea is that you can actually get students to come in in advance a bit more prepared. So looking at some of the definitions we have, have out there, um, the EduCause uh, seven uh, steps to flip classroom or seven principles to flip classroom. I will send you that PDF actually um, afterwards because it's quite a good summary. Uh, defines it as a, a model where the homework and the in-class elements are reversed. So any sort of structure that has some sort of pre-recorded lecture followed by um, the interaction in class. Locke and Borland actually give the pedagogical rationale for it in terms of the face-to-face -face time is then more effectively used. Instead of using up that face-to-face -face time to deliver content, we're actually using the face-to-face -face time to develop a deeper understanding, to think about the issues in advance and bring your thoughts to the session. Young and Mo's, um, in particular, uh, have uh, Clive Young as one of the, the proponents and the lead people in terms of the use of video for education. Well, he said that um, he's brought together quite a, a number of ideas about flipped classroom in one of his papers, um, and actually brings in that idea of um, the academic's role as well. So the idea that the academic is there to facilitate the in-class session and tap into it. But these ideas are actually not new. Back in 2006, a chap called Eric Mazur did a lot of work uh, thinking about how the role of the lecture could be more active and more engaging. And so actually, the flipped classroom is an old model, but it's actually becomes the forefront now because of things like um, personal capture, YouTube, the ability to create lectures in advance has made this sort of model more appealing. There's also an argument, perhaps, that it leads to more student-led learning. Um, and one of the things, one of the quotes I found here from an article by Enfield, a quote from a student who said they were confident in class in understanding the sorts of terminology, but when they got home, they actually realized they didn't get it at all. So when they tried to apply the theory that was delivered in class to their out-of-class experiences, they actually found it difficult. So the idea of the flipped classroom is actually to get students to think about where their weaknesses are before they arrive to the face-to-face -face session. So I mentioned at the start uh, in, the, in the blurb about this webinar that we'd be looking at this from a blended, a blended design perspective. Now, uh, Richard's um, got our five-stage blended design model here. Uh, the idea that the flipped classroom is essentially just the same as any other blended learning, the combination of the online and the face-to-face -face environments and how they mesh together. So some of the considerations I'd like you to think about throughout this webinar are outlined here. First of all, how you might prepare in the blended design model, how you identify your rationale, why are you looking at this approach, and how are you going to create that link between the online and the face-to-face -face learning activities. Now, the further detail on how you might think about that relationship between um, learning objectives online and learning objectives and face-to-face, -face, we've got in our York Technology Enhanced Learning Handbook in section 4.2. The next step is to think about socialization. So that's really about um, the human element, shall we say, setting expectations, understanding where students might be coming from when they first enter your module, what might they be expecting, how you might need to manipulate those expectations somewhat. Um, because as we'll look through some of the case studies, in particular, I've found this myself, when I've tried a few of these flipped learning approaches, students perhaps aren't used to that. So that's something that's worth um, uh, considering early on. 
There are also elements to do with the technical induction. Can all your students access your resources? This might be particularly true for distance learning students where if you're using a platform, perhaps YouTube, and you have students who are trying to access an environment where YouTube isn't possible, um, then that could also pose some considerations. The third step is, is actually now we look at how participation is going to take place. How do we get students to engage with that material and how do you get them to bring that material into the face-to-face -face environment? What are the links between the learning activities? And then fourth stage, how do you sustain that? How do you do that on a weekly basis? If you've got a module that's adopting the flipped classroom approach, how are we going to do that on a regular basis? And, and perhaps what are the constraints there too? For example, if you're doing a team taught module, you're going to have to think about how you're going to make some sort of harmonization across the different approaches that the lecturers might have. And finally, the fifth, but I would always say the most important phase is how you close it, how to bring everything together, how do you link all that to uh, the learning objectives for the module. So those are some of the considerations I like to think about as we look at some of the examples later on in this webinar. So flipped approaches then, um, thinking here about content delivery before class and learning activity during class. Now here's a little uh, test for you to see if you can use the webinar platform. Uh, Okay, that looks great. Thanks very much for sharing your ideas there. So let's have a quick look um, at what's uh, similar to some of these ideas of content delivery. We've got here um, the use of uh, the YouTube videos, the use of talking head videos. And actually, the, the role of the video um, is quite common in flipped learning, but the type of video can vary quite a lot. So yes, you could have a talking head, you could have um, for example, what you can see now on the webcam here, me talking at the web camera for five minutes, maybe 10 minutes um, straight, just explaining the concept. But you could also think about different forms of video, so perhaps handwritten content, perhaps even looking at um, some sort of animation that, that provides a better explanation than just simply the verbal explanation. So yes, certainly videos take a very strong role in the terms of content delivery remotely, but that video content itself can take a variety of forms. I've got a couple of examples that I'll show you in a, in a few moments where um, you can compare the different approaches shown by those two videos. Uh, audio files, again, the, the idea of a podcast in advance, students um, listening to their uh, lecturer um, in advance of the session um, on the train, on the bus, or hopefully at home with a notepad in front of them um, to get them prepared for what's coming up. And again, that's a, a model that's been used quite widespread, actually, um, and, and probably very quick to do as well, because you can do that on your own phone. You can create a podcast, essentially. This idea of an online interactive tutorial is something that I'd actually encourage uh, a little bit of thought over as well. Not just the delivery of content, but the idea that students are engaging with that content. So ensuring that students are actively participating with that content in advance of the session, not just in the session. So there's a difference here between watching a video passively and actually doing something with that content. And that's the first step we get into where students are starting to reflect on their own understanding. And this is where the flipped classroom can actually be very strong. It encourages students to consider what they do know, what they don't know, what they, what they don't quite get through either the answering of quizzes or the application of theoretical ideas to um, problems or problem-based um, scenarios. So this idea of reflection questions in advance is actually quite key. And as we look at some of the cases um, later on in this webinar, you'll actually be able to judge whether they've met that or not. So moving on to what they might do in class, um, role plays, case discussions, so again, applying um, some sort of theory to a specific application. So taking the theory from before class and bringing it into a, an applied activity. But not just an applied activity that you would do probably independently, this is an applied activity in a group situation. So where you have different thoughts, different ideas in the group environment, um, different perspectives, and allows students to then explain how they interpreted a concept and as a group, perhaps with a partner or in a wider group, being able to um, sort of get a better idea whether they've got the right sense of that or not. And this is where the role of the lecturer can also come in. 
Eric Mazur's model um, was used where he we set the students up in problem-based groups, applying their learning, and then he went around those groups to check, do that checking of understanding and to address any misconceptions. So uh, they call out the, Socrat the so Socratic method, the idea of quizzing someone to, to un make sure they really do understand it rather than um, basing it on assumptions. So all those sorts of activities um, you can do, you can do that uh, simply as a, as a group activity or you can do that as um, maybe a, a collaborative exercise, everyone's got a laptop out, creating a collaborative document, a um, variety of different approaches there. Okay, so moving on, um, I just wanted to touch upon the use of the video then. And this is a model that uh, comes from Clive Young and Sylvia Mose as part of the Recall project. And um, we currently have lecture capture positioned here. So lecture capture is the standard sort of recording of what happens in a face-to-face -face environment. And that's really um, here positioned to support um, very passive engagement and students just remembering the, um, the basic fundamentals of, of the, the lecture content. Now, I think this is actually quite a simplistic um, uh, description of the role of lecture capture. I think lecture capture has a, a greater role elsewhere um, further up this higher order learning um, spectrum. But if we look at this sort of middle area here, this idea of activity using video clips, so the video clips that have been created specifically for student activity, i.e. the flipped learning videos, and this idea of presenting knowledge, but then with some discussion afterwards, is encouraging students to think about how they might apply those theoretical concepts. So if we can move from the idea of just videos being content delivery to videos supporting active learning, then you're starting to get more familiar with the ideas and principles of flipped learning. So there are a couple of examples I'd like you to look at now. If you wouldn't mind just opening up your web browser and having a look at these. So I'd like you now, if you could just spend a couple of minutes typing into the chat box there, um, what your thoughts were. What what do you think the strength was of the replay one? That's the one with the, the webcam recording the, uh, the lecturer and the webcam recording the uh, notes on the, on the page. What were the strengths of that particular type of, of video delivery? Okay, so we've got a few ideas here about the, the role of the, of the visual, the visual role, particularly um, with this maths-based um, lecture, the idea of writing out the mathematical notation and going through the same thought processes as the lecture is actually very important. And so the, the, the slowly writing out of the equations and so forth is, is actually part of the learning process. It's very different to just present the, the uh, formula straight on a, on a lecture slide because there isn't any, um, you're then sort of deconstructing it rather than constructing as you're going through it. So it's nice here to, that you've identified the idea of, of the visual element, the idea that the, the learning is supported through seeing the lecturer, seeing how they're going through that process. And that's actually part of the strength of the flipped learning um, design, where you have that content you're delivering in advance. The students can then play that back as many times as they like. And if they take that idea forward into the lecture environment, rather than what we heard at that very first slide that I showed from that student quote, they sort of got it in the lecture, but then when they came to apply it afterwards, they didn't quite get it. So that's one of the real benefits of having that webcam approach, and certainly makes it very personal, which if you're doing a distance learning type of module, then having that webcam to show the human behind the, the narration is, is quite important. What might be some of the constraints then of that particular type of lecture delivery where you have um, that handwritten content and, and the visual uh, of the lecture? What are the constraints on that? Absolutely, it's a much, much slower delivery. And that's some, one of the points that we probably need to think about as well in terms of how much time is given over to um, creating those resources, but also how much time students are expected to use to engage with them as well. Okay, so thinking about the other type of model, the, the quick one I did there, now you can be critical, don't feel, you know, I'm not going to um, take anything personally. What are the sorts of benefits and constraints of, of the, the standard sort of slides and voiceover approach? Um, the handwritten approach where actually if you're just trying to convey lots of content, um, perhaps that's not ideal for more theoretical ideas. 
Bruce identified there is a better way of getting lots of content over if you do it by slide delivery. And again, you can still play into the idea that students have control over the um, content because they can pause things, they can look things up as well in the middle of that. So yes, I probably would say that the slide format is a better way to get lots of content over at once. The slower handwritten thing is better for explanations that require that thought process as you're creating the resource. The YouTube one does have closed captioning, um, but accessibility element is, is very important. We can do um, closed captions um, subtitles on replay as well. Um, that is definitely something we can do. Um, but it, you're quite right out there to point the accessibility issue, and I'll touch upon that a bit later on. So to have a quick summary then of the potentially different approaches um, that could be used, we have to move from this idea of passive, just lectures and documents provided online to making something a bit more active. So not just providing the uh, YouTube video, but providing some sort of self-check quiz, asking students to create a summary paragraph, how they've interpreted it, that could be marked, or it could be used in some sort of peer marking process, um, applying to a particular problem, or what I've termed it artifact creation, I just mean creation of some other resource. So that could be a Google site or a portfolio. Then we bring that content into the class. So it's no good just delivering this content on its own. It has to be brought into the classroom environment as well. So here we might have mini lectures perhaps to take those um, initial ideas and take them the next stage or to address any student concerns, the things that they've picked up in advance of the lecture that um, perhaps need a bit of reiteration with mini lectures during the, um, the class. Um, again, further use of documents could be an idea. This idea of in-class polling, so polling your students during the session to see how um, they're getting on with the ideas, but also using class polls at the start of the session to see where students want to focus their attention, leading on to addressing the knowledge gaps, directing towards discussion and debate, or if you've got a particular type of um, model, perhaps in law, for example, you could then do an application of the theory to particular case studies. That's certainly something we've seen in health sciences as here as well. As a case study of um, health sciences, I circulated um, with the email earlier, and it's also available in the Yorktel handbook. So then FIPS approach is bring into the classroom the knowledge, interpretation, experience from different perspectives. So getting students individually to interpret the content and then bring them together. So very much a social constructivist type of model actually. But also you need to do something with them. It's no good just getting them to do the, the activity on their own. So we've touched upon um, some constraints already. Um, I'm just going to summarize here what I've identified as some of the key constraints. So the creation of time, um, the time that the lecturer needs to create the resources, the time that students need to engage with the resources as well. Um, accessibility we've already indicated here. If you're delivering content, core content remotely, not being in the lecture environment, then you need to consider how that's going to be affecting disabled students. So key lectures should be subtitled. If they can't be subtitled, then you, you could be falling foul of um, disability um, legislation there. There might be other measures, for example, if the students have um, support they would normally use for this face-to-face -face lecture, disability service might be able to reallocate that to support students using the lectures online instead but you wouldn't be able to get both. You wouldn't be able to get the support for both online and face-to-face -face lecture. So captioning, providing summaries, different types of accessibility um, approaches you can use, and I'd be happy to discuss those with you if you need to. Also, thinking about how students will be engaging with those resources. We've already identified there that students will need to do some sort of activity with the, with the video, but what if they don't? What if they cannot, um, or they don't have the time? What if they don't want to engage in the way that we need them to, to make the most of that face-to-face -face session? What's the fallback going to be? Or what are the punishments going to be, shall we say? But I think the but actually comes down to setting the student expectations, making it really clear that this module is delivered in this way in advance, not telling the students on the first lecture that's how it's going to be delivered. So when they're making those decisions about how they want to engage with the course content, how they want to take that module in the future, let them know that it's actually going to be delivered in a particular um, model. Technical support um, is obviously going to be key as well. If students can't access recordings, who are they going to contact um, if there's an issue? So some of those sort of nuts and bolts type um, considerations also need to be put in your planning. There's the idea of complacency, assuming that students have watched the material and um, 
if you don't have activities that actually challenge and allow you to measure the student's learning in the face-to-face -face environment, you could fall back into that complacency position where you assume the students have learned something, or worse, the students think they've learned something when really they haven't. Class size might also be a key constraint, and that would actually affect what happens in your face-to-face -face environment. The flipped learning model, I would argue, probably is more geared up towards smaller class sizes. Um, mainly because of the way that the lecturer would need to be involved in the face-to-face -face environment is much more in, in interactive with the student. So how can you enable that lecturer to move around a class of 200 in order to provide that um, checking um, that you wouldn't be able to do normally in a lecture? There are a couple of models, and one of the ones I'll show you in a second from um, UCL um, has a, a, a sort of a class size of 80, but where the lecturer did go around um, in, in a sort of um, almost like a forum approach, a Q&A session. And finally, again, this goes back to the pedagogy and the design of um, the whole module. What about the cognitive leaps that students will have to make in terms of the threshold concepts, the, the threshold theories? If they don't get a particular theory in the first couple of weeks, how is that going to impact on how they understand the rest of the module? How are you going to check for that cognitive leap? How are you going to support students through that cognitive leap? Um, it could mean that you need to redo some of your flipped videos if they don't quite um, match what the students are needing to learn from them, if they're not quite meeting the learning objectives that's required. So let's um, move on now to a couple of case studies. The first one I wanted to show is uh, it's quite an old one, but it's quite a good one from chemistry. They, they actually wanted to address some very basic lab skills. And what they did is they recorded some videos demonstrated through here with um, a text-based narrative um, uh, added onto the video, posted it on YouTube, and got the students to watch the videos and answer um, a pre-lab quiz, which they had to do before they got access to the lab. So here we've, we've taken the delivery of some quite basic, fundamental, um, practical concepts and have shifted that online so that we're not using the face-to-face -face time to tell students how to connect up a, a conical flask, but we're actually getting them to do, use the conical flask in the lecture environment instead. So here's the sort of the model. We start off with the lab task uh, being out um, detail from the outset. That prompts students to look at the video, which they then move into checking their knowledge from the video, and then they actually do the practical in the session. Another case study, which was actually recently appeared in the uh, forum magazine, has just been circulated last week, uh, comes also from chemistry, from Andy Parsons. And he, um, in his article, um, did a nice outline of his approach. So he started off by identifying a particular topic that was going to be covered that week, delivered a video lecture, a short video lecture. Students had to use a fill-in handout, and they have this model in chemistry where actually during their face-to-face -face lectures they have this fill-in handout as well. So we use the same sort of approach um, when using the video lecture. This then um, had students posting questions that arise from their independent study, so questions that they didn't quite understand a particular part of content, and then that would lead to discussion in the classroom environment, so a Q&A type model in the classroom environment. This model here is a, is a, uh, actually comes from a um, uh, pharmaceutical course in another university, uh, but I like this because it actually gave you an insight into how that face-to-face -face environment might work, and more importantly, the links between the offloaded content, the online content here, and the face-to-face -face environment. So here they have some what they call self-paced um, modules. So that's sequential learning. So they've got a, a, some material videos, text-based materials that students work their way through. Uh, and then here they have identified the complex concepts, the concepts that students, the threshold concepts, the concepts students really need to grasp before they can progress with the rest of the module. And that's where the face-to-face -face time is spent. So their face-to-face -face time is actually broken down into some sub activities so beginning with some clicker questions testing the student's knowledge getting giving the lecturer an opportunity to check how well the students have understood the concepts then they do some sort of pair and share this is an idea of um, peer instruction so getting the students to perhaps repeat their understanding of a particular concept to their partner and then getting their feedback on that using the idea of a micro lecture, so a three minute tiny lecture on, on a particular concept, and that's very focused, meeting very specific learning outcome to, again, enable students to 
really understand the concept in the lecture environment, but not spending too much time on that, because it's the idea that students are spending time understanding and, and, uh, uh, and questioning their own understanding of those concepts instead. And then that follows on with some, perhaps some student presentation discussion or other um, sort of form of formative assessment. But then, though, it's, it's important to remember that it actually comes after the lecture as well. It's not just before and during. It's about what happens after the lecture. How do they take their understanding, apply that to their assessment, apply that to subsequent topics? The final case study I wanted to show here came from UCL. Uh, again, this is the idea of presenting something in advance, but also getting students to vote on what topics they want to focus on in the lecture environment. And that could sort of open a can of worms, perhaps. But if, you're, if you know your subjects, you can deal with these different um, questions in either in advance or deal with them at the start of the session to ask students where they want the lecture to be focused. The lecturer might have prepared, again, some of those micro lectures, some of those common queries that they can just pull up um, depending on what, where students want to focus their attention. And that means that the class is now more of a plenary, it's more of a Q and A, it's, it's more student led. Now that idea of student led is actually challenged by some of the other literature, which actually says that this flipped learning model actually forces students to engage with the content more on a weekly basis. So instead of just sort of passively sitting through the lectures throughout the whole of the term, and dealing with all the revision at the end of it, cramming, if you will, the flipped model actually structures the student learning better because they have to engage with the resources in advance and meet the weekly um, structure of the, how the content progresses through the term. So just reiterating back then onto the learned blended learning design, in those case studies, we have pretty much seen how there's been preparation, some sort of idea of setting expectations. But if we flip back to that last one, the UCL one, there is that big gap here. And as identified by um, the author of this blog post who described this, he actually said, well, what happens after the lecture? How do I know that they've taken those ideas from the lecture um, that plenary session and actually did really understand the answers I've made. So again, we have to think about not just what happens before and during, but what happens after as well, and the idea of linking things together. Just to finally wrap up then this uh, presentation, I just wanted to give you some suggestions for how you might design things. So starting off with the videos, um, Again, be very focused here. Now, what I mean by being focused is don't go off on a tangent. Don't sort of throw in an extra um, fun fact, if you will. Keep it very succinct, meeting a specific learning objective. Outline those learning objectives at the start of the video. Put them into the um, text-based description that might um, that, that leads on to the video. So to give an example from um, what a VLE site might look like, if I just bring that, just give me a second. So something like here, um, this is a typical VLE site. You would link students through um, from some sort of outline, identifying the learning objective, to watching the video, to doing the activity, maybe some further resources later, but the focus that very succinct activity and the video is in the middle there and you're putting all the superfluous stuff um, outside of that. It keeps the videos nice and short, makes it easy to make them accessible as well. In class, um, as a lecturer, you are focused there on enabling interaction. You don't want to try and fall back to the lecturer position of talking to students. You want to get the students to do all the work in the class. But that requires you to go around and actually interact with the students. And this idea of supporting reflection, supporting students to reflect on where their knowledge gaps are. In terms of quizzes, um, think also about how you might be using the VLE platform to develop these quizzes, not just for um, students to self-check, but to provide some form of feedback. Perhaps at this point here, in the feedback first in quiz answers, you could say, look at this subsequent resource, look at this additional resource, or you haven't quite got that one, take a look at this part of the video instead. Crucially, though, questions aren't just about factual recall. The questions should be about application of knowledge, putting students in a particular situation to, again, test their understanding of those concepts. So here, again, here's an example of um, the accessibility one. Um, you give a scenario and then give a few um, possible options for addressing that scenario. 
Also, um, allow time to address misconceptions in class. So if students aren't understanding the answers, if they aren't, they have those knowledge gaps and they still aren't getting the content, make sure that you allow time in class to deal with that. Don't just assume that, okay, most students did all right. Um, maybe there were a couple of questions that they didn't get right at all across the whole group. You can use the VLE question analytics to work out how um, students are performing and actually target your in-class micro lectures instead. My final point is about consistency, and this actually came out some of the literature where students were finding it very difficult to engage with the flipped learning model, where the activities, where the style of lecturing um, differed on a weekly basis. It's far better to have a consistent approach across a whole module that students can get into, get into the rhythm of, rather than mixing it up all the time. So if you are going down the flipped approach, maybe you only want to use it for a couple of weeks, make sure that um, that is consistent across those couple of weeks and certainly consistent across a whole um, module environment. Also, try and create those links between topics. Try and create that, that link from one week to another, again, to help students with that structure and that consistency. And link it to the assessment. Why are students particularly engaged in this topic? How does that link further? What, how does that meet the learning objectives of the module? How does that meet the learning objectives of the program? So those sorts of ideas are sort of some of the design considerations that certainly comes out of the literature as well. And um, uh, the, the links I provide you in the references here, um, I'll circulate these slides afterwards. Please do follow them up because they could be, um, I've certainly found them quite useful in understanding some of the, the benefits and constraints of um, how the flip model might work. Okay, so that's all I have for the um, the content, shall I say, and that's my delivery to you. Um, I'm here now um, for 20 minutes. I very much appreciate your comments and um, what your ideas and questions might be around the flipped classroom model.